So we have been talking in recent episodes about cosmic impact phenomena. We've been looking at the Tunguska event, which occurred in April, uh, excuse me, June of 1908. We covered that pretty thoroughly. Then we had a couple of episodes where we were looking at the proximity of near-Earth objects and close flybys that have occurred in the last three or four decades and have learned that those types of close encounters have occurred way more frequently than any would have anyone would have imagined a generation or two ago. What I'd like to do now is get into the actual impact cratering phenomena where objects from space strike the Earth, and we'll take a look at a little bit of the evidence that it's accumulated over the last few decades for the formation of craters and astroblains. Let's talk about the difference between the two. A crater generally, now this is obviously overlap in the definition, but a crater generally is an open bowl-shaped structure or depression that we can actually see in the landscape, and it's quite obvious, such as Meteor Crater in Arizona near Winslow is the the type example that we would invoke in in terms of a classical crater shape where you have a bowl that was excavated into the earth by the impact the actual surface impact of an object remember the tunguska object was an atmospheric impact it detonated in the atmosphere so what we're going to be looking at now is the geological consequences of actual impacts into the ground surface itself and we will look at in this episode, what I'd like to do is just sort of introduce you to the broad spectrum of impacts. We're going to be looking at a sample of the almost 200 now confirmed impacts that have been recorded in the geological record of the Earth. And then we will be looking somewhat at the biological consequences, but that will be primarily a focus of another episode of Squaring the Circle in our efforts to completely unpack this whole phenomena of, of cosmic encounters, what it means for life on Earth, what it may mean for the geological story of the Earth, and what it may mean ultimately for the story of civilization, human civilization on Earth. So let's get right into it. And First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make an obvious connection here. The connection between natural phenomena, impact phenomena, cosmic phenomena, such as we've been talking about, and some of the traditions that have come down to us through various mythic and religious and legendary sources about events that have happened in the past. So I'm calling this Unsealing the Apocalypse, because once we get into the the legacy that we have inherited of past traditions, I think we're going to begin to see the, the quite striking and extraordinary parallels between the accounts of these events that have happened in recent times, where people have lived to recount their experiences, such as we saw, I think, very clearly indicated in the stories coming out of the Tunguska event of 1908. We're going to see that there's a very strong correlation between the imagery of myth and legend and folklore and traditional sources and accounts as there has been from the more recent scientific and eyewitness accounts of cosmic phenomena. So I'm calling this Unsealing the Apocalypse, Cosmic Catastrophe. So let's jump right into it. We'll begin with a gallery of impact craters and astrobleams. Now an astrobleam as I was talking about, is a little different than a crater. It means star wound. And an astrobleam is an impression in the landscape, the planetary landscape, made by an actual impact, but it's not so evident. It's usually highly eroded. Sometimes it's completely buried under sedimentary rock or, or other depositional material. And so it's not really visible too much from the, from the surface, but it's still there. Ground-penetrating radar and LIDAR surveys and so on are showing up things that we don't really see too visibly from the surface that have been laying there hiding just beneath the surface for, for in some cases, millions, even billions of years. So it means star wound. It's, it's, think of it as a scar in the landscape. 
So crater, the hole in the ground. An astrobleem is a scar on the Earth that may or may not be readily discernible. All right, so the, the phenomena that we hold responsible for this is usually the impact of an object from space, typically an asteroid, and an asteroid can be a variety of things. It can be carbonaceous, which is roughly the, roughly the density of a, a typical rock that you would find, a typical sedimentary rock that you might find walking along a, a creek bed or, you know, a river bed or whatever. An iron asteroid is going to be much closer in density to a piece of cast iron. And of course, their consequences are going to be different. A smaller iron asteroid can deliver as much kinetic punch as a much larger carbonaceous chondritic or stony asteroid. So at the lower end of the spectrum was what we began this conversation about talking about the Tunguska object, which was probably not much more than the density of ice. So each of these kinds of materials is going to have a different effect when they strike the, the planet. In the case of a low density like Tunguska, they might, and small enough, they're not going to make it to the surface. They're going to blow up in the atmosphere. The denser the object, the smaller it can be because it's more capable of penetrating the atmosphere to strike the surface. This, this particular graphic here is pretty cool because what it's showing us here is what I believe ultimately we're going to be moving towards is the idea of a simultaneous multi-impact type event where you have a comet nucleus or fragmenting or a, an asteroid breaking up. So it's not a single impact. It's a multiple impact event. And I think that's ultimately what we're going to see represents the greatest danger right now to civilization is a, not a single Tunguska type event that could be very, very devastating to a location or a region, but a multiple impact event that could be, you know, more continental or even hemispheric, if not even global. Encyclopedia Britannica tells us that meteorite crater formation is arguably the most important geologic process in the solar system as meteorite craters cover most solid surface bodies, Earth being a notable exception. Well, is Earth really a notable exception? Well, we have no reason to assume that Earth is being impacted any less than any of the other bodies in the solar system. What is different about the Earth, of course, though, is its active biosphere, its plate tectonics, all of the things that cumulatively will erase or degrade the evidence of an impact whether crater or astrobleem. Craters become infilled with sediment. The rim, the raised rims will erode down so they're not as readily seen. They will get consumed through plate tectonics, through continental drift and subduction, the process of subduction, which is where one continental mass or one tectonic plate overrides another one. So you have erosion, you have deposition, you have tectonic processes, you have volcanic processes, you have seismic processes, you have biological processes, all of these things together tend to degrade and slowly erase the evidence of impact phenomena. So if you have a, a small impact that would create a, a depression in the ground, you know, a few hundred feet in diameter, which there are many examples of, as a matter of fact, they're not going to last long. Now, the Meteor crater in Arizona that's so obvious and so impressive, a kilometer wide, 600 feet deep. The estimated range of time is usually around 50,000 years old. So in 50,000 years, it hasn't degraded much at all. However, under other circumstances, yeah, it, you could have accelerated phenomena that would cause an acceleration of the rate at which one of these features is being eroded. But the point is, the point is this, between the Earth and any of the other solid bodies in the solar system, Earth has all of these other processes and systems functioning that tend to erase craters when they form. If those weren't operational, we, and we could strip away the biosphere and the layers and layers of sedimentary rock that have filled in a lot of the earlier impacts, great impacts, 
there's no reason to assume that the Earth wouldn't look very much like the moon. And we know that the moon has had hundreds of thousands of impacts over the life, its lifespan. So Earth is actually a much bigger target, a much more massive both gravitationally and in its, you know, its actual cross-section. So we would assume, there's no reason to assume there wouldn't be just as many impact events on Earth as there is on the moon. But obviously the Earth doesn't look anything like the surface of the moon in terms of the density of the cratering. But that doesn't mean that the Earth hasn't been struck even more times than the moon has. And I think that, going back to the quote here from Encyclopedia Britannica, I think the idea would be that we're at a beginning to learn that the impact processes are extremely important in the history, not only geology, but the biological history of the planet. What we're going to do now is we're going to talk about some of the simple processes. I've got a couple of cross sections here to help you understand the cratering process so that when you start looking at the images, you can uh, understand better what we are looking at. All right, so these, these two diagrams, we'll start with the simpler case showing us the processes of crater formation. So we've got two examples here. We've got a simple crater and a complex crater. Let's look. Some of the differences are subtle. Others are more prominent. If we look look right here, we'll see the, that the complex crater has a central uplift. We'll also notice that there are these fracturing, these ter terrace formations along the rim here, which will show up as a multi- ringed structure. A simple crater, we'll see the, our first examples of craters in our gallery that we're going to look at will be a simple crater. Most famous example is Meteor Crater in Arizona. Let's learn some terminology here. Breccia is the fallback material. There's a whole bunch of stuff that gets thrown up into the air uh, as a result of the impact, and then that stuff falls back to Earth. It can fall outside the crater or inside the crater. Obviously, the heavier and bigger stuff is going to get th thrown less farther, and the finer, smaller stuff is going to get thrown farther. So a lot of the bigger stuff actually falls back into the crater. And you'll see here that there are two bottoms to the crater. There's the current, the present bottom, which is actually not the original depth of the hole. The original depth of the hole in, is this bottom line down here. But then with the, because of the material that falls back into the crater, there is the, there's the final depth of the crater as opposed to the transient depth of the crater, meaning it just lasts for a little while. Underneath, you've got the fractured bedrock. That's going to become important down the road when we're talking about exobiological processes because fracturing in the rock allows the, the movement of water through the crust, which is very important. And when we look down here at the complex crater, we see that there is this, the two things that primarily distinguish it, one is the larger diameter, but then is the, the fault terracing on the sides and the central uplift.